Uh, this is Ben Hartman with EliteFTS.com. I'm interviewing Justin Harris. Uh, Justin, what are your uh, general philosophies on Circa or Perry Workout Nutrition and how have they changed over the years? Uh, they haven't really changed much over the years. Uh, I mean, it's been, I think, you know, years ago it used to be just post-workout nutrition and then we started doing some, some intra and some before-workout nutrition. And so that's, that really hasn't changed. I've been doing that since 2004, 2005. But uh, since I've been gone, when I left, it was the high, uh, the high molecular weight carbohydrates were, you know, amylopectin. Those things were, were kind of the rage. Since then, it's kind of changed to the, the cyclic dextrins, the highly branched cyclic dextrins or cyclodextrins, which I think are really interesting. The highly branched cyclodextrins are, you know, basically they take a high molecular weight carbohydrate. I think it's actually amylopectin. You add an enzyme and it kind of folds around itself. And I don't know if everyone really knows the cyclodextrins. That, that, that literally what it means, dextrin is just carbohydrate. You know, maltodextrin is dextrins in a multi yeah, chain. Yeah, yeah. And so cyclodextrins are just uh, cyclic. Yeah. And so, I mean, it really is. It's like a cone, like a highway cone, basically. And so they take this enzyme and it takes this uh, amylopectin, these high molecular weight carbohydrates in it, and it folds it around itself into a cone. So it's this highly branch, and it's still a high molecular weight carbohydrate. And it's even denser, if anything, you know. But I think one of the one of the things that I think is really interesting with that with uh, cyclodextrins is, is, uh, I, and I've said this before, but as soon as I heard about cyclodextrins being used now, I, my first thought was Febreze. You know, that's because that's what Febreze is. Is they take these Febreze, I think, is beta cyclodextrin, and and it's a seven ring molecule, and it's in a cone shape. It's hydrophobic on the inside, hydrophilic on the outside, and so stink basically gets sucked into these cones and stays there. And you don't smell it anymore until you wash it. And it yeah, reverses exactly. The yeah, and that's how Febreze basically got started. And I actually thought uh, I had been kind of looking at, at these cyclodextrins a few years ago for actual hunting uh, applications for like uh, oh, scent-free yeah. hunting scent, sprays. Yeah, scent masking. So I thought it was kind of interesting uh, w when I came back and these and these cyclodextrins are all the rage because I think there's a ton of potential. I mean, you have alpha, beta, and gamma cyclodextrins. Alpha cyclodextrins are six rings. Uh, beta are seven and gamma are eight rings and there's all kinds of things you can do you can methylate it you know methyl beta uh psychodextrin the alpha psychodextrins are the perfect size to bind cholesterol and so you can do various versions of the alpha uh psychodextrins to basically for a cheat meal or something you can oh, yeah. you know bind, bind the cholesterol and the beta i think the, the highly branched psychodextrins i think are seven rings i think they're beta I should probably read, read up on that. But I think the, the gamma cyclodextrins are really expensive. I've looked into them, but the gamma cyclodextrins are eight rings. They're a little bit larger, and you can do things with hydroxyl groups. You know, an OH group at the end is going to bind four carbons into solution. So you can do something like that where you can basically take some kind of carbon-based supplement and get it sucked into these cyclodextrins. So your hydrolyzed proteins, your yeah, branched yeah. amino acids. Yeah, there you go. And stuff. so, yeah, everyone knows the hydrolyzed proteins are all the rage, too. That's another thing that's newer. But the problem with them is they taste like garbage, you know, bitter, they, they're hard, hard mm -hmm. to taste. And so if you can find something like that, like a large, like you just said, a larger ring, something that will trap these, these things in. And then basically you, you still, the, the total molecular weight of the whole carbohydrate amino acid system is still going to be. It matches the carbohydrate, yeah. not the. Yeah. So it's going to get shuttled right down. You're not going to get the bitterness. The problem is, is finding those right. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I think you can find them. It's finding ones that are affordable, I think, more or less. Do you think that offers a significant advantage over, you know, you talked about you know five six years ago the, the waxy may starches and the mm -hmm. uh, you know the the Swedish patented starches that were out at the time. Mm -hmm. Do you think that offers a substantial benefit given the cost potential well, increased the, cost? The, does it give a benefit? Yes, uh, substantial is you know something you can argue. And and I've said this. I've written articles on overcomplicating things. You know I, I enjoy the science. We both mm -hmm. love the science of it. And we we we'd love to talk the science about it. We hardly ever actually talk about the. Uh, the benefit, the actual physical benefit, because the science is what interests us. There is a benefit. I mean, the science shows that these things will work. You know, the science from day one, the science showed high molecular weight carbohydrates are going to provide benefit. Now, Ronnie Coleman was a pretty big dude without using those things. Mm -hmm. So, how much benefit do they actually give? That's you know, at the end of the day, you they will give a benefit. Now, now. They give a benefit if you're already doing everything else right. If you're eating, they're, they're the five percent where yeah. the other ninety-five percent has to be there. Exactly, and if, and and the problem is a lot of these people that focus on those five percent aren't doing the ninety-five yeah. percent. I I always say people skip the dollars to pick up the pennies. Yeah, exactly. What, do the basics first, do them consistently over the yeah. course of time, and as an add-on, as a bonus, as the icing on the cake, mm -hmm. then you can worry about you know the circle workout nutrition and the intricate you know amino acid ratios and the molecular weight of different carbohydrates mm -hmm. and and all that might be that extra five percent mm -hmm. where you know, somebody who has a champion mindset and a solid foundation before that, 
might be a benefit. Mm -hmm. Definitely. You get these young kids going out and spending all their money on, you know, really advanced, you know, intra workout supplementation. And measuring and they everything. Eat, and they, yeah, measuring it to the gram and timing it, you know, with the exact, you know, amount of water to get the right osmolarity of the solution. And they're eating two meals a day. Yeah, and cereal for breakfast. Yeah, cereal, and, yeah. And, and pizza at school for lunch or whatever. Yeah, and mm -hmm. that's, that's the problem is these things do have benefit. The word substantial is important because. For someone like that, a, a high school kid that's, you know, if he's not eating the, if he's not getting, you know, a, a, comp, a complete protein, a meat-based protein, egg-based protein, something like that, you know, four or five, six times a day with a complex carbohydrate and a, and a, and a essential fatty acid, a healthy fat in each meal, then these, these things aren't really pro providing a substantial benefit. There's still, there's still a benefit over not eating anything around the workout, but, you know, like you said, the 95 and 5%, mm -hmm. you it, do the 95% first, then worry about the 5%. Well, oh, and what people seem to forget, too, is that the digestion rates of even a traditionally fast protein like a whey protein is still going to elevate plasma amino acids for, f you know, four, five, oh, six yeah. hours yeah. after you do it. We've talked about, you know, after a hard leg session and you vomit, your food from six <laughs> hours earlier you're comes eating, right yeah, back you, up. You train at, yeah, 7 o'clock at night, you're yeah. throwing up at, at 8, 8 o'clock after your leg workout, and you're puking up it's your eggs from thing. the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know. It's a and and a, a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the circle workout nutrition kind of is piggybacking off of, you know, the difference between pre and post. And some people say post only matters or pre only matters. What they're forgetting is that, that a lot of those studies were done in fasted people. Mm -hmm. A bodybuilder eating every three, four hours over the course of the day, eating a solid, you know, animal based protein source mm -hmm. is never going to, yeah, they're never fasted. Almost by definition, yeah. a bodybuilder is never fasted. Never. Because yeah, if you are fasted, you're not going to look like a bodybuilder. Mm -hmm. So what do you use around your workout then? Uh, I've dabbled here and there with anything from hydrolyzed whey um, to the, you know, formerly like the waxy maize starches. I've dabbled with Vitargo. Uh, I remember years ago when, when all the rage was hydrolyzed whey and a maltodextrin dextrose combination, mm -hmm. and that seemed to work just fine, mm -hmm. you know, given the time period. Um, nowadays, everybody talks about, you know, fluid volume, you know, especially getting it in your system, having cell hydration. So a part of that is going to be having a solution that is dilute enough. That's what and I, yeah, so, I don't you mean know, to cut you off, but that's the thing, these high molecular weight carbohydrates. And I've, uh, I always talk about what's really not, what's less important is that they're high molecular weight. What's more important is the uh, osmolality, yeah. of, osmolarity of it. Is the, yeah, well, it's the percentage. Yeah, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's based on a solution. A high molecular weight carbohydrate in a 15% solution has an osmolality of 11, where your blood is like around 300. But, it, but if that's 15, so only 15% of the, of the solution is actual carbohydrate. That's a lot of fluid. I mean, that's 32, mm -hmm. 64 ounces well, of fluid. Well, even all, all the original sports drink research, you know, focused on a 6 to 8% solution. Yeah. Now, granted, they were using sucrose and dextrose uh -huh. and things like that that don't absorb quite as well. But you get these people and they have a 70 gram uh, cyclic dextrin shake and they mix it in 16 ounces yeah. of water. And so wonder at why that point, they still have gas. Yeah, your osmolality is not 11, your osmolality is 200, which is not much different. It's than not going to empty any faster yeah. than anything yeah. else. Yeah. So it's I interesting you said the, the sports drink too because I always that was always very interesting to me because the original Gatorade studies were much lower mm -hmm. in carbohydrates and much higher water in fluid yeah and so but you know they brought that to you know that's what they originally used on the Florida Gators which is why it's the Gatorade, Gatorade yeah. yeah and but they brought it to market and that didn't taste very good so they had to double triple the sugar yeah then people wanted to buy it and the problem is it's no longer a sports drink it's anymore. not yeah it's, no, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's drink. a sugary drink yeah and yeah. then you get people that uh, you know, the original research used certain carbohydrates and now they're using a lot of the high fructose corn syrups and things Save because money. they are cheap. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a margin thing. Yeah. Um, so I started off doing a lot of that. Um, anymore now, I tend to stick mostly with some sort of free form branch chain amino acid supplementation with a, a, a moderate amount of some sort of easily digestible carbohydrate. And I think people, again, they- We they, talked about the branch chains too. Is this something I think that gets over, overlooked a lot? And I've heard a lot of people even even in, in arguments online, say, you know, as long as you're getting the essential amino acids or getting the complete amino acids, that's what really matters. You're going to get the branch chains. What people forget is the whole point of all this is to stimulate protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. And those branch chain amino acids are really what's triggering that. And well, so, and, you know, people will eat a whole food meal two hours prior. They'll have a peak of muscle protein synthesis, which then declines in between meals, but you can't keep adding fuel to the fire, it's mm -hmm. not going to get any bigger. So adding complete proteins within a small window of time from your pre, you know, let's say your pre-workout meal isn't going to have any s substantial muscle protein synthesis rates over that initial meal. Whereas a branched chain amino acid supplement, uh, for lack of a better term, kind of re-stimulates and clears mm -hmm. the plasma amino acids that you already have available from that meal mm -hmm. for synthesis. So um, I tend to eat a you know, a, a balanced meal, maybe one to two hours before training, depending on what I'm doing. It's usually, uh, for me, I prefer a whey protein based um, 
protein source. I don't like a lot of food based, mm -hmm. you know, like chicken or something out before I lift. Uh, and then really it's branched chain amino acids, maybe some electrolytes, um, you know, some add ons in, in pre workouts, you know, blood flow agents like agmatine and citrulline, um, some acid buffers like beta alanine. I think all, mm -hmm. all, you know, can play a role in there. But I think really if you have enough fluid, possibly some electrolytes, depending on, you know, the nutritive status over the course of the day, if you're salting your meals and eating enough, you know, fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. that's probably a moot point at that mm -hmm. point. Um, unless you have a substantially long workout, you don't need, and, and you know, we've talked about this, you don't need, you know, 150 grams of, of cyclic dextrins for an hour long weight training workout mm -hmm. doing 12 or even 16 or 20 sets. Even even a high volume training session for a 200 or, or larger pound individual, they're not going to burn any more than 150 to 250 calories worth of glycogen over the course of the workout. Well, there you go. And that's, a, that's something people people f forget it, the glycogen, is muscle glycogen. Well, when you buy a steak, are you counting the carbohydrates in that steak? You don't. The because glycogen that's in the steak. Yeah, yeah. That, they're very, you know, in a huge, you know, a large bodybuilder, 250 pound competitive bodybuilder, maybe can store a thousand grams of glycogen throughout his entire body, including the liver. So that's a thousand, I mean, that's a thousand grams. People want to eat a thousand grams of carbohydrates in a day. Well, and they don't understand if you're doing chest, you're not depleting back glycogen and leg glycogen. Yeah. Muscles preferentially will use glycogen that's closest to, yeah. to where the contractions are coming. So even from a blood glucose standpoint, people think I have to fuel the training with this mm -hmm. drink. You're primarily fueling the training with the glycogen that's yeah. already there. The extra glucose or the, you know, whatever carbohydrate source that you're mm -hmm. getting, you know, that eventually becomes glucose, you have some insulin secretion, which is beneficial. You have mm -hmm. some reduction in cortisol, which is beneficial, mm -hmm. but you don't need 500 calories of that drink to mm -hmm. necessarily do that. Is that a good time period to put extra calories? If you are looking to, you know, add, you know, carbs and, and uh, proteins to your diet over the course of the day, absolutely, it couldn't hurt. But I don't think it's, it's a necessary piece where you have to have, you know, 60 grams of hydrolyzed whey or hydrolyzed casein and 100 to 150 grams of cyclic dextrins during workout. I think for somebody your size in a mass gaining phase, that still might not even be useful because you're, I, I know you're eating six meals a day. So, mm -hmm. Well, like we said, well, the whole point is to stimulate protein synthesis. We talk about all these numbers and all these different things. I think we should actually, what, what happens with protein synthesis is, you know, you, at, at a particular muscle cell, you need all 20 amino acids available. And so the, the spike in insulin is gonna increase the uptake of amino acids at that area. The, uh, the essential amino acids are gonna make sure that you have all 20 amino acids, you know, or co complete protein is gonna make sure you have all 20 amino acids, but you still have to, th there still has to be the stimulus for that, mm -hmm. for that protein synthesis. Yeah, yeah the, the nutritive intervention can be there, but if you're not having the training session that, you know, causes, uh, you know, contraction-based glucose and amino acid mm -hmm. uptake in the cell, you can have an insulin spike and you can have all the substrate present and it doesn't mean it's going to get in there mm -hmm. maximally. So, and again, the hydration plays a huge role in that to yeah. begin with. So I think people, hydrated muscle. I, I think if, if people did, you know, a modern amount of basic intra-workout, you know, nutrition mm -hmm. focused on fluid, focused on a quality pre-workout meal, mm -hmm. that's probably the 95% or greater of, of what you can do. Then post-workout becomes less of an issue because mm -hmm. you have plenty of substrate available during, and that's still going to be available for, you know, for that mm -hmm. few hours after training. I actually, I actually probably carry my during workout nutrition. In it becomes a post-workout. Yeah. I do the same thing. Yeah.